My name's Annette Markland. I'm from Exton. I was born in 1951, which makes me 62. Your family's been connected with the army for many years. Can you tell me more? My dad was uh, in the Army Catering Corps and he was actually um, serving in Korea when I was born and he didn't actually see me till I was three years old. Um, so I grew up in the, in the military because he, he, was, he was still in. Um, I um, met my husband um, when my dad was stationed in Bulford. Uh, we got married in uh, 1970 um, out in Germany in uh, area Gutteslohe. So he was serving in Germany when you met him? No, he was serving in, in Balfour Camp, oh, on Balfour Camp when I met him. And my dad was stationed there as well. Uh, and we met. And um, that was about 1967 and got married in 1970 uh, out in Germany. Um, we had uh, David in 1973 and his sister Laura in 1977. David followed in the family tradition by going into the services. When did he join and who did he join? He uh, started off um, with Chorley Cadets, Chorley Army Cadets. Uh, he never ever wanted to do anything else, only, that was the only thing he wanted to do. I wasn't particularly uh, wanting him to do it. It's a, it's a hard life, especially when you get married and the men are away. Um, but he went, uh, his dad persuaded me and said if he, if he went and he got a trade, then we should let him go. Uh, so he went when he was 16 and a half down and joined the Royal, Eng uh, Royal Engineers. And he went down to Deal in Kent to do his, um, his training and his boy service. And then he went on from there. Where did he see service over the years? I think his first active was when he was about 19. And he went to uh, Bosnia. And I really didn't want him to go because I still thought of him as a boy. and. I thought, you know, your dad's had so much more life experience, I'd rather that your dad went. I thought I could just see him one day in his nice tight khaki t-shirt and his hard hat on his digger thinking, oh, I'll move that mound of earth. And he could uncover anything, there were so many atrocities went on there. Um, but he, he was fine and he went, um, he went a few times, although I did worry about him. He went to, um, I think David, did David do Iraq? I'm not sure if he did. And this was his, um, he visited Germany and up and down the UK and things like that. This was his second tour of Afghanistan. The first time he went, he was um, involved in laying the runway in Camp Bastion. And this was the different kettle of fish. What happened to David? David was killed by an IED. Um, um, he was with the Gurkha squadron um, and he really did think a lot of those lads. He said he's never worked with lads so dedicated and he really did think a lot of them. And they had, he'd just been home for his R&R &R in the January and gone back and I was fortunate enough to see him while he was home. Um, they'd been out, they went um, to start clearing the route for Moshtarak when that, when that was happening. And they'd been delayed for a couple of days and sent them deployed somewhere else to do another job. And so they were late getting there. And the Americans had this um, armoured vehicle that was supposed to uh, detect and remove IEDs, but that got blown up, so David and his, his boys had to take it on foot. They had, um, from, from what I can understand is that they have like um, concrete pipes that sort of go under the, under the road. I think that the roads are not like our roads, they're dirt tracks, 
and I think it's some sort of drainage or something. And I think um, it collapsed. This tube had collapsed, and they had changed the components of the IEDs to more plastic components than the metal components. And five people had crossed this before David, all checking to make sure there was nothing there. But David was at least twice the size of, of a Gurkha and weighed twice as much. And he was behind, he was marking, they marked with yellow paint the side of the road to where it had been cleared. So following troops knew it was clear. And uh, as he as he walked over it, it, it exploded and um, blew him across the wall and into um, the canal. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Gurkhas uh, actually jumped the wall and jumped in the canal to try and help David. Um, there could have been any number of IEDs in the dike, you know, as they're trying to get him, but he had massive, massive injuries. He'd lost both of his legs, um, a couple of fingers. Uh, he had lacerations to his body, but he had a massive um, head injury, and they think his death would have been instantaneous from that. You obviously heard direct from the Ministry of Defence. What were your feelings at that time? I didn't hear directly from them. I heard from my daughter-in-law, because she is David's next of kin. And uh, I'd been to work that day and it was, to me it was just a normal day. I'd gone home um, and I got home about 5.30 and the phone was ringing the minute I got in. And I picked up the phone and, and she said, um, Anna, I'm sorry, but we've had some devastating news. David's been killed this morning. Hmm. I screamed and screamed and screamed and screamed. Oh dear God, no, not my boy, but... Um, you call him your boy? Yeah. Of course, but how old was he? David was um, two weeks off being 37. He, would, he, he got killed on the... Um, He would have been maybe three weeks off being 37. He got killed in the beginning of February and his birthday was on the 28th of February. So he's nearly 37. By which time he was well through the ranks. What rank was he at the time? David was uh, W02. And um, he just found out that he was um, going to... It's a very rare post, this um, squad... Squadron Sergeant Major, SSM they call it, and he just got this SSM in, um, in Northern Ireland, so he was happy that he'd got his promotion. But he was a bit unsure about Northern Ireland, but he was happy he'd got his promotion. And you were obviously very proud of him. I was very proud of him. David's dad died in 1999. He would have been very proud of him as well. How can you reconcile all this three years on? Initially, I was very... You're very angry and you don't understand... You, loved ones, you don't understand their grief because you, you don't think that anybody's grief is more important than your own. But when you think about it, nobody is having the same experience. Everybody is grieving for a different person. Although it's the same person, I grieve for my son, my daughter grieved for her brother, my daughter-in-law grieved for her husband, and she also grieved for the boys, for their daddy. So, although we all grieve for the same person, we were all different. And when the anger subsides, I had to think, I had in my own head to turn a, a negative to a positive. And I thought, I thank God, really, for, for giving him to me for 37 years because he could have given him to somebody else. But we, I had him for 37 years to love and to cherish. 
and he was such good fun. How would you like David to be remembered? I mean, David was a really responsible young man. Um, but that was his work side. Um, he was fun loving, a good dad, a good husband, an excellent son. I couldn't wish for a better son. And a devoted brother. Yeah. You now see David's name put on the war memorial in Ashley Park in Chorley. What are your feelings when you see David's name there? It's a bit of a mix of uh, sadness and pride, really. Pride for the man that he grew into. Um, and obviously sadness because he's not here. Finally, you, your family, and a group of you in your home village of Exton are looking to erect a war memorial. And obviously David's name will go on it. What would be your feelings when you see David's name there? I'll be glad to, uh, to see it there because, you know, they, all these young men have paid the ultimate sacrifice and, and they've given their life for the country, uh, for the Queen and country. And um, they should be, they should be recognised. Annette, thank you very much. You're very welcome.